Response since this is going to be a, a hip hop uh, inspired lecture. We're going to talk about hip hop. We're going to, we're going to use hip hop simply as a, a point of departure to examining um, some, you know, critical issues and and, uh, and critical thought for that matter. That I think young people, as well as people my age, as well as um, people much older, need to really work on, especially in this country, is learn, is honing their critical thinking skills. And so, um, as we go, uh, I hope that. It sparks some questions or comments that you might have. Uh, feel free, if you want at any point, to like raise your hand and to, to chime in on something. But there will be a question and answer period that I want to try to get through. Um, a decent amount of information um, in this uh, little bit of time we have. Hip-hop, what does it mean to you? What, I want to get good, bad, ugly, what have you. What, what does hip-hop mean to some folks? I mean, just right here, my man. Hip means intelligent. Hip-hop is a movement. So the meaning of hip-hop is intelligent movement. Right. What does hip hop mean to you? I'm gonna call on one of my old students. What does hip hop mean to you? Um, basically, what you said. It's very negative right now in the media. Right. So I don't really think hip hop too often. At least that, that's how it's portrayed. And we're gonna get into that because I see hip hop as a microcosm. When you look at the flow of information, I see hip hop as a microcosm of the flow of information that we see in the U.S. So hip hop, when you look at mass media in the United States, okay, remember. If you notice, I keep saying, in the U.S., in the U.S., in the U.S., and I want you to, to think about that. Um, the reason I keep saying U.S., U.S., because I, I've had to, years ago, retrain myself from, from referring to this place that we live in, that, that, that is occupied by, what, 300, 320 million people, from referring to it as America, to the U.S., all right? The U.S. is the nation, that, that's where we live. The label of the United States, just America. It's kind of like the same way of just calling the music that you listen to on the radio or you see on BET or MTV as hip-hop. What you see on TV and on the radio, that, that's rap, which is rhythm and poetry. But hip-hop is a culture comprised of several different elements, okay? So hip-hop, all these things are what hip-hop has come to mean for me, all right? Growing up in the community, in the innovation, fellowship, activism. Um, I caught the activist bug that I haven't yet to shake, and I don't think there's any kind of elixir or vitamin C tablet that, that's out there that I want to take, that I could take to, to shake the activist bug. But it was hip-hop that really struck that chord within me as a youth, 14, 15, 16 years of age, because a lot of the hip-hop artists, a lot of the folks that I looked up to, not just athletes, not just, but also people in my community, but, but when, when I look at folks on TV, the athletes and, and, and Entertainers. When I looked at the entertainers, the Chuck D's, the Karis Ones, the Kumo D's, the Queen Latifahs. They were, you know, they, there was an activist chord through, throughout all their songs. There was a there was a chord of, of activism. There was a chord of, of of saying, "Listen, you know, hold your head high, young brother. You know, be proud of who you are. Be proud to be black. You know." And so, hip hop instilled all these things within me. And I'm not novel. If you talk to anyone that's around my age, <laughs> late 30s, early 40s. Even folks in mid thirties, they'll tell you they're, they're perhaps, and if they're hip hop heads, they'll perhaps tell you, and they'll get kind of nostalgic and maybe teary eyed about what hip hop meant to them growing up. And and so I wasn't the only one. There was legions of us um, across the country. I mean, rap is something you do. Hip hop is something that you live. So he earlier said, Karis One. Karis One's the one that that you know appropriately you know described hip hop as being as, as such. Rap is something you do. Hip hop is something we live, all right. Hip hop is the culture, and so within that we have break dancing, <coughs> better known to hip hop heads as b boying or b girling. Break dancing, and we'll learn a little bit down the line that break dancing is something the media, the media um, kind of affixed to it. Um, we have uh, rapping, we have DJing, we have graffiti art. I know it's kind of cut off. Beatboxing, knowledge of self, knowledge of community, uh, urban entrepreneurism, and that urban fashion. Hieroglyphics to graffiti, I like to just simply pay homage to the folks in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, um, who we know of, the, of, of the, 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 what's known as the words of God, meta and Netra, all right? But the Greeks came in, because you've you, you got to understand, the reason I, it wasn't just I, that 
Marcus Garvey said what he said about if you don't know your, your people out history of their uh, or knowledge of their history and culture is like a tree without roots. I wasn't just saying that because if you don't know about anything that you're delving into, you know, um, whatever field that you're going to, you, you should know about the history of that field. You should know about that. You shouldn't just go into things blindly. You should know about these things. If you're reading a book, know about the history of the author of the book that you're reading. And that will give you a better idea once you start reading what direction he or she is taking you in and why they're framing things in such a way. Okay? So it's vastly important to understand that, like, for instance, this, this word right here, hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics. All right, we're on an HBCU. Um, a lot of you, you know, are immersed every single day in... in in black culture throughout your classes and, and different social programs that, that go on. Hieroglyphics is what the Greeks renamed metaneter, all right? The words of the gods, the word of God, all right? And this is, and you know what hieroglyphics are, you know, the writings. And because they, they made these intricate drawings and, and, and uh, pictures and words and the basis for the alphabet that we know comes from ancient Egypt, Kemet, um, because of that, a lot of that, we, we know what ancient Egyptians look like. So we turn on, turn on the, 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 the TV and you watch uh, a movie called Museum, and you see this guy running across. You remember Ben Stiller, right? Mm -hmm. The funny guy, like his movies. But if you look at that, that film, it becomes very frustrating if you're a historian. If you know the half, even if you're not a historian, just if you know the half, as, as we say in hip hop, it becomes frustrating because you see it and you're like, that's. When, when they were in the museum and this guy who was uh, supposed to be like a, a, an Egyptian pharaoh comes out, it's, it's completely false. Like, he wouldn't have looked like that. He wouldn't have been pale-skinned. He wouldn't have been that. It, all right, he, he wouldn't look like that in any shape, form, or fashion. We know that not just because of this, but we also know it because of the carbon testing by scientists um, that black, white, and in between, so, you know, and uh, since we're talking about scientists, Cheikh Ante Diop, who have done, who did the carbon testing and found out exactly what the pigmentation was of ancient Egyptians. You've heard that term, it takes a village, it takes a village, right, to raise a child, but it took a village to do a whole bunch of other things. And so he would tell your story, my story, and then the village would come together and, and determine what, what's a good resolution for us. All right? Many, many African societies had no terminology, no wording whatsoever for prison or jail. Okay? And they lived very, very communally. What will be known today as socialism. But socialism is a way that indigenous communities, whether they're here in the U.S., whether it's one of the 500 plus nations of indigenous people, otherwise known as Native Americans, they live very, in a very communal type way. Uh, or if it's indigenous people in the continent of Africa and other places, they live very, very communally. And the whole concept of, I can go and purchase land, you know, I can do this, it was completely foreign to them. Completely foreign to them. We share the land. We share the land. We sow the, we sow the fields together, and we reap what we sow. We do this, and we, you know, we raise one another's kids, and we come up together. So this is all African history. This is all world history. Don't even isolate it. This is all world history. So, handbone to beatboxing. Um, we know about handbone. Anybody know what handbone is? Huh? Who said that? Put you on this. What's handbone? Uh, do you want to describe it? What? I think it's the one where they use the hands and feet. Yeah, hands and feet, right? Is that, does that sound familiar? Like handbone, handbone, have you heard? Mom's going to buy you a mockingbird if that mockingbird is saying. And so, the, and so you got to think about this. This is really important because think about the ingenuity of folks who, listen, I don't care who it is, any historically oppressed people have somehow found a way to persevere, to per persevere throughout some of the hardest conditions. So when enslaved Africans, not slaves, because you, take, you just call people slaves, you take away their identity. Enslaved Africans who were ripped away and brought to different parts of the Western Hemisphere, certainly not, what's, not, not just what's now known as the U.S., but throughout Britain. Places in Brazil, Ecuador, even Mexico. There's an African population today in Mexico. So they were brought over, right, by the, the British, you know, Spaniards, Portuguese, you name it. So the Dutch, what they did was they took away their drums. They wanted to rip away their culture because if you don't know your culture, if you don't know, if anyone here loses track of who you are, or if you think it's not a good idea 
you don't have to be an African historian. You just have to, you, you know, it's important for you to know who you are and from where you came from. Once you learn that, it is, makes it much easier to see more clearly where you're going to go. I don't care what major you are. It helps, okay? So it's vastly important that, that you understand these things. So they took away their drums. They said, we, you know, we're taking away the drums. You know, we're going to prevent them speaking their native tongues. We're going to mix them up. We're going to soon rename them. Your last name is now going to be Williams. Your last name is going to be Harrison. Smith. Uh, Smith. Barney. What have you. You know what I'm saying? You're, this is, this is going to be your, your new last names. This is going to be your new, your new uh, first name. You've seen that legendary scene in, in, uh, in Roots. What's your name? What's your, uh, Kunta Kente. <sighs> What's your name? Kunta Kente. It's Toby. And just kept whipping him and whipping him until he broke him because he needed him to be somebody other than an African. He needed to be somebody that other than an African. He needed him to be domesticated. Domesticated. Because you can't bring in that many people, all right, that many people, and expect to keep them, to, to keep them oppressed and, and, and enslaved if you don't in some shape, form, or fashion domesticate them and have them believing that this is their lot in life. This is your lot in life to serve you, okay? So what they did is they started to, when they took the, away, took the drums away, the men started to beat their chests, beat their chests, and make and replicate the sounds of the drums. And the women would sing along. They would replicate, and they would do it on the plantation. They would do, they would do it wherever they could, all right? So this, was, this is where we get handballed. And then some of you that are in fraternities, some of you that are in fraternities, whether they're Alpha or Sigma or sororities, or Deltas, or AKAs, what you do, the stepping, the strolling, what, this, is, this comes from handball. That comes from handball. And beatboxing comes from handball. And it comes from our ancestors. This is a snapshot of the, of the golden era, the era of consciousness. We know about the native tongues, Queen Latifah, Lonely Love, uh, Black Feminist Movement. I don't, if you were just playing it, you and I, T. Webb, right? You were just playing it. He was playing it earlier. Um, anyone ever heard of uh, Ladies First? Yeah. Ladies First. Powerful, like powerful video. If you've never seen the video, go, when you, when you leave, go home and YouTube Ladies First. And it's powerful. And you see how those sisters are pictured with, throughout, that, throughout that, uh, that, that song. Uh, and throughout that video, and you see how Queen Latifah uh, on the album cover, All Hail the Queen, so I still have my, I still have my copy, and she's in, front, she's in front of the map of Africa, and she's wearing a kufi, and she's just standing there, just regal-like. I mean, it's, it's, you juxtapose that to today, to what we see, we, what we see promulgated and promoted out there, what we see green-lighted out there, the scantily clad, and, and these images are nothing to, 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 to say, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just the, Sign of the times. No, we can harken back to 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 um, shadow slavery, where black men and black women were stripped down, butt naked, and and rubbed down with with linseed oil to be to be paraded across auction blocks and stages, and that's exactly how it went down. And they would be purchased two hundred fifty dollars, one seventy five for him. All right, and bread. I'm glad the sister. Thank you. I, I need that that calm response, please. If I say something that strikes a chord, yeah, so she, she gets it, she understands. These are, this, is the, this is the golden era name drop. These are all names that I was exposed to at age 13 and 15 and so forth. These are all names that I was exposed to. The late Kwame Ture, formerly known as, as Stokely Carmichael, uh, Huey P. Newton, Ida B. Wells, uh, Ida B. Wells, heroes of mine. So this today, though, we go from here to here. This is commonly just a snapshot of the corporate name job, the corporate rap name job. So as being exposed to this, I'm no different than these little shorties today. The only thing that's different is that coming up, I was exposed to different things than they were. You expose youth to themselves, that their, their rich history. I don't care whether they're black, brown, green, what, ha what have you. You expose a little Italian kid to his history. You know what I'm saying? What do you think is going to come up? But we see our white counterparts, and they oftentimes have a much better grasp of their history than, than we do, okay? Because a lot of things haven't changed in public school systems. It's not like they have, you, you would think that U.S. history would start with, with the Pequod and the Abenaki and, and all those 
indigenous people and start with them, the, the original folks on this. But no, it starts from a very different view, a very Eurocentric view, okay? And so this is what I was exposed to. And because I was exposed to this, it lifted me up, it built me up, it built me into like who I am today. It played a major role. Just like if I was coming up and I was exposed to this, this can build you up to a great loyal capitalist, a hyper consumer. This can build you up to somebody completely devoid of, of knowledge of self and, and any sense of who they are. They may walk around and they, they may even have a six-figure job. I've seen a lot of six-figure folks walking around that have, are completely oblivious of who they are. Completely oblivious of who they are. And that's the real sad thing, because if you are oblivious of, of who you are and how, how, how you've been impacted in a negative way because of a lack of exposure to certain things, you don't know where to find, go to find it. Now, if somebody exposed you and says, listen, brother, listen, sister, this is not you. This, this, is, this is what we came from. This is what's going on. Now you have a paper trail or you have a, a, a verbal paper trail to, to look and to find and say, okay, let me start my, let me, let me start my expedition to discover who I am. These are some of the issues that, were, that I was introduced to. So this is all now starting to mix. This is hip-hop and, and this is media literacy. And this is media. Now we're starting to fuse the, the two together. These are issues <coughs> that were discussed in the golden era. Police brutality, rampant poverty, uh, educational inequities, racism, oppression, violence, uh, violence within the black community. I <laughs> tend not to say black and black violence because I think it's a loaded terminology that limits people's understanding of the root causes of black and black violence. But that's a Another story for another day, which that day was yesterday, which means we need to really start to address the social conditions, the social, socioeconomic inequities, um, the lack of, of, of resources that various communities get, and, and, the offspring, and, what it, and the offspring that come from those things. Okay? Politics, prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex. These were all discussed, and as Chuck D one time said, Chuck D said, CNN, I mean, Chuck D and uh, Jam Master J. He said, they, they said CNN, like, uh, hip-hop is like our CNN. It's like black folks' CNN. Because this is, this is where we get our news. Because when we turn on CNN, we don't, get, we, don't get, we don't get the whole story. We don't get issues that are going on in our community right now. Unless they want to talk about the crime rate and they want to dramatize how violent we are. So, that was our CNN. But better than CNN because... It wasn't, it wasn't so financed by, by large corporations as CNN is. Um, so these are also issues that are, that are addressed in hip-hop today. But these issues that you see right here are wrapped by artists that they don't want you to know about. If you're a casual hip-hop fan, they don't want you to know about Dead Prez. They don't want you to know about Nerubi Selah. They don't want you to know about Immortal Technique. And they don't want you to know about Invincible. They don't want you to know about Brother Ali. They don't want you to know about Head Rock. They don't want you to know about so many, so many artists. Asheru. Um, they don't want you to know about so many artists that are out today. There are more artists today that are talking about these issues than when I was coming up. The only thing is they're not played. But there are droves and droves of hip-hop artists that address these kind of issues. All right? Jaseri X out of Pittsburgh. I mean, they're, they're doing amazing things. Amazing things, and I also invite everybody, because at the end, I'm going to give, I have my cards, you can call me on my, directly on my cell phone or email me, and I will send you a list of these, all, these artists, and you can go to YouTube, and you can um, hear their music, and perhaps decide down the line you want to purchase one of their albums, but I mean, there's some unbelievable brothers and sisters, that, are, that and like I said, remember that name, Nuruvi Sela, this, this sister, she was in my latest documentary, um, Hip Hop, White Supremacy, and Capitalism, and she is out of Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> Sister spits fire, unbelievable. Um, just, just to give you a little, it, so there's things that we should be. So just like, as that's, I start off by saying, hip hop is a microcosm of the media. So these issues, you're not really supposed to know about. You're, you're not, you're not supposed to know about about a lot of these issues. They're, they're considered too complex for you, and for most, most Americans, they're, they're, that's what they're considered too complex. Okay, not by me, but those that control them. To control the flow of information. Trust me, they don't want you to understand about the, the, the prison industrial complex. They don't want you to understand how right as it stands right now, right now in 2014, 
unless things change, one in three black men in this country is destined to be incarcerated. One in three, in some shape, form, or fashion. If that is not a critical, if that is not a crisis for a community, I don't know what is. So that is something that you need to, because listen, if you take a cavalier approach to this, if you decide to have children down the line, then your children will inherit, will inherit the negligence and the, th the issues that you decided were not an issue. They will inherit in some shape, form, or fashion. I'm not saying they're going to be they're going to be affected by crime, but we are connected. We're all connected. All right, we are all connected in some shape, form, or fashion. So all, these are all issues. So look, you look at this. We, we talk about this continues to be a country, a nation that there's no universal health care system. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is not that. By the end of this year, when that act clicks in, right, that's right, because most people have been programmed only to know by a sloganish name, Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that way they throw it out at you, and that's, and you know what I'm talking about, sister, because if, if they put it out there, Obamacare, Obamacare, then you start saying Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And because so many Americans have been, have been dumbed down and mentally manipulated, they know that you won't take the next step to find out what the name, what is the real name of the act? Affordable Care Act. The, exactly, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And it's, it is not universal health care. All right, at the end of this year, we will still have 17 to 23 million people that are left off. It's not universal health care. And it, even if you have the platinum, the platinum version, the highest version, it only covers 80%. This country desperately needs um, universal health care because every year that 44,000 Americans a year die simply because they have no health insurance. Mm -hmm. All right, the last, and you talk about it, the most opulent country in the world. And so we rock around and beat our chest. Yeah, I'm from America, or whatever. You know, even though you may not be opulent yourself, you may, you may not be, you know, wealthy or whatever, but you, 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 you know, beat your chest and this kind of like false bravado, I'm the number one, number one, which I, I, I simply just don't get. Um, this whole, like, everything's got to be ultra-competitive, but also it happened to be the last industrialized country post-World War II to adopt a universal health care system, all right? And you, some of you also will um, inherit, once you graduate six months later, some of you will inherit student loans that will kick in, and you'll be paying those student loans for a while, as I'm still paying mine, you know? I'm a decade plus path after grad school, and I'm still paying mine. But you talk to some of your comrades, you get a chance to travel, you go some other places and meet some people internationally, even places like that, that you might not even suspect, Venezuela, Cuba, they don't pay a dime to go to school. You go to Norway, Denmark, I was invited to go do some lectures in Norway a couple of years ago. Um, they don't pay a dime. They don't pay a dime to go to school. Not a dime. And it starts off pre-K all the way if you want to get your MD, PhD, master's degree, what have you. Friday was April 4th. April 4th, 1968, somebody was assassinated. Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. Martin Luther King stood for a whole lot more than the little snapshot that they have conveniently tried to package and give to you every once in a while, every January. Content of the character and the color and, and then the color of the skin. They don't, they don't even tell you the rest of the speech about him saying the the check, um, you know, owed to black people has, has, has bounced, all right? But they surely don't tell you about 1967, a speech he gave at Riverside Baptist Church where he referred to the U.S. government. He said, my own government is the greatest purveyor of violence on the face of the earth. I dare anybody in this room, anybody in this room, to tell me that's not true in 2014. It is more true than ever. When you talk about the drone, track, the drone attacks that are devastating people from where Dr. Sadiq is from in Pakistan, devastating them. They don't show you on the news. Every single week there are Pakistanis that go and they and they they will go in front of the US Embassy and they will get on their knees and they will pray and they will protest. So please stop the drones. But since we don't see it, it's out of mind. We think that oh they're just happy about it. Just like the happy slave, right? So you know we just show these pictures. Yeah it was tough for black people, but they were kind of content. They were kind of Happy, right? Because if we just don't tell them about the Stoner Rebellion and Nat Turner and then Mark Vesey and Gabriel Prosser and tell them about the real story about, about Harry Tubman, they won't know that African people, black people were resisting every step of the way. <coughs> so Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, we can go, the list can go on and on. And we're talking about 96% of the people, and I say that conservatively, conservatively not liberally, conservatively. 96% of the people that have lost their lives 
from these drone attacks have been nothing less than innocent civilians. Civilians! Imagine if you're from Philadelphia and some country, Slovenia, says, oh, we have a, we have a, uh, we, 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 there's somebody that, that's, that we deem as a terrorist, you know, there's been no due process. And, and I'm, not, I'm not justifying terrorism in any shape, form, or fashion. So just as, as it was terrorism that took down those, those, those two towers, just as it was terrorism that took down those two towers and took, and took out thousands of innocent civilians, what do you think it is when later that year, in November of 2001, the U.S. orchestrates air attacks in Afghanistan and kills more, more innocent civilians than were killed in the towers? What is that called? Is that not terrorism? The U.S. does these numbers before they even attack. They, do the, they have actuaries that do these numbers, and they know how many civilians are bound to get killed, and they call it collateral damage, and we don't ask a question what that means or why. This guy, Edward Nays, is known as, he is known as the father of modern-day public relations. Really quickly, he is, the, he is the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He wrote several books. He was hired by the U.S. government. The high, he was hired by the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, who, by the way, was a very, very racist, racist man. Yeah, I'm telling you that maybe for the first time, Woodrow Wilson, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he was very fond of the Ku Klux Klan in the movie called Birth of a Nation that he showed in the White House. But anyways, that's another story of another time. So he, was, he hired Bernays. Bernays was also hired by the cigarette industry to get more women to smoke cigarettes. He was hired by the pork industry. And you, want to, you, you hear it all, we, we hear it all the time. You watch a, a, a dentist commercial. It says five out of six doc, uh, dentists or three out of four doctors or, or you know, say that brushing your teeth with Crest is, you know, such and such, or you start, you know, you eat this, and it's the start of a healthy day. And we never ask ourselves, because we've allowed ourselves to be dumbed down systematically from pre-K all the way to where we are today, so we don't ask the questions, well, how many, how many doctors, how many dentists did you poll? He was hired by corporations because he knew how to manipulate the, 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 the public mind. He said, they won't ask a question, just tell them. Five out of six doctors say that starting your, 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 your breakfast with two strips of bacon is the start to a healthy day. They won't ask a question. And it worked like a charm. He's the one that came up with the three words together, support our troops. Because the U.S. government was not, I mean, the people were not behind World War, World War I. And so the U.S. government was not engaged in World War I until late 1916 and, and, and so forth. And we know that war ended in 1917. Woodrow Wilson wanted to get everybody everybody that was against the war, for the war. He didn't get everybody. We got a whole lot of people within six months, and then that was enough of a basis to go into World War I. You had a question? Yeah. So, sure. Um, me being a part of the freshman class, like, I started to see like, what most people are saying with you know, how you're raised and like, what, mm -hmm. like, like being this, like, Born in 95, I understand what you're talking about with the music. Right. Like, all I hear is music about women, money, and drugs and whatnot. Right. But it's just the fact that you, it's, it's hard when you got the wrong people at power. Yeah. So, like, you can't really, you know, break out of it when you got other people leading and who shouldn't be the leader. Right. So, like, what do you do when you stuck with the wrong leader? You create new leaders, man. That could be you. I might, I might be looking at it right there. I might be looking him right in the eye. Straight up. I'm, I'm telling you straight up. You are. Yes, I, I am. Yeah. And, and what's your name? Because I don't want to... I, then, Will, please make sure we exchange information because I, I don't want to forget that name. Because if there's anything I can do as an elder, it's crazy for me to say I'm an elder, um, somewhat, but I've got plenty of elders above me that continue to guide me. But Will, Will, there, there were folks in the 60s that were asking that question. And, and, and you had, in the 50s, you're asking that question. You had the emergence. We've always had the emergence of, of these leaders. Now, we're almost at a different time because now they can kind of mask. As Malcolm said, he referred, referred to the media like, as Novocaine. Like, it causes you to suffer peacefully. So you go to the dentist. You know he's doing some damage or she's doing some damage to your mouth. She sticks you in the mouth that Novocaine. He sticks you in the mouth that Novocaine. Takes your, your, his, their hand out and it's covered with blood. All right, so you know that there's some kind of damage being done to your, you know, to your mouth. All right, to some extent, but you suffer peacefully. You suffer somewhat peacefully, 
And so that's what Mal Malcolm said. He's like, he's like but you, we suffer peacefully. And so um, it, it's, it's very, very important to, to understand that, like now, they use the media. Folks use the media as a distraction. Reality is a distraction. Reality shows, I mean, abound. People running home, you know, back to the dorm rooms or to their homes. I mean, and it's not just your generation. It's my generation. I know folks my age that are doing the same, same darn thing. So, but it's our job to, to help create um, spaces, almost like, uh, you know, offensive lines, to create spaces and holes of opportunity for young men and women like yourself to emerge as these leaders. But we can't even in expect you to be the leader and to fulfill the potential you have unless we make sure that you're vastly educated about the issues that are going on. Because once you get that platform, because you may have way more influence to, to achieve far larger platforms and, and audiences than I have here. Um, but if, but that, if that time comes and, and you, you are right there and you're addressing 10,000 people, we all fail, that for those of us that are around you, that knew about you and the potential you have. We all fail if you get up there and you don't have a firm or a comprehensive grasp of, of various issues that we need you to champion once you get in front of those folks. So that's, that's why it's, it's a collective. We all, we all play a role. So I, I, I totally feel what you're saying. I totally feel what you're saying. But we, we just have to create these openings. And there's a lot of different ways, and that's why... Like, for instance, I decided to, to start an independent media um, and become an independent journalist.